I'm going to talk to you all today about the effects of DNA databases uh, on crime, on particularly on deterrence and detection of offenders. This is joint work with Anne Sophie Anker and Rasmus Landerstow, who both at the Rockwell Foundation in Denmark uh, and had access to amazing data that we're able to use for this study. Um, and so, so the the motivation for this study is that uh, you know DNA databases and a whole bunch of other what I think of as similar high tech tools. Um, uh, is expanding around the world. Uh, and all of these tools work uh, by increasing the probability of getting caught rather than increasing the punishment. So instead of putting people in prison for longer and longer and hoping that will deter crime, the goal is to, um, is to identify offenders uh, more quickly and uh, with more accuracy and higher likelihood uh, in order to deter them that way and perhaps take serial offenders off the streets more quickly. And so these tools have a lot of potential, but they essentially work by keeping better tabs on everyone, right? So there's a surveillance component that people worry about quite a bit, and this brings privacy costs. And so reasonably, citizens want to know what they're getting in exchange for their privacy. And so in this paper, we consider the effects of DNA databases on recidivism in Denmark using the timing of a massive database expansion as a natural experiment. So the research question we have in mind is what are the effects of DNA databases on the individuals who are added to the database? And the punchline I'm gonna show you is that the DNA databases have a big deterrent effect on criminal behavior. So what are DNA databases? Uh, basically, they, the, uh, you collect a saliva swab from, from someone who um, is, is supposed to be added to the database and use that DNA sample from the saliva swab to create an identifying streak, a string of numbers that are unique to you. You can think of this as being akin to a social security number where the numbers themselves don't have any inherent meaning, but they are unique to you. Um, and I think crucially, uh, people worry that because it's DNA, it involves lots of sensitive health information that is not the way they're used uh, in, in, this, in this context. So it doesn't involve analyzing anything else about you. It's basically just coming up with this number. So qualifying offenders are added to government DNA databases where their identifying numbers, this DNA profile, uh, are compared with identifying numbers from DNA left at crime scenes. And this way then, DNA databases match profiled offenders with DNA from crime scene evidence. And so the purpose here is to lead authorities to a suspect they would not otherwise have identified through their, you know, their traditional um, investigative methods. Uh, and in general, it's very difficult to avoid leaving DNA at a crime scene, um, even property crimes. And we think of this as being, you know, there's DNA if there's a big pool of blood, but even in property crimes, you can analyze much smaller um, uh, pieces of DNA at this point. And so it can be useful for all kinds of crimes. Um, and so, uh, so we can almost think of it as being a, a more accurate and more useful fingerprint in many ways. And then local law determines which groups of offenders are required to provide a DNA sample. In the US, this is all legislated at the state level. In, in most countries, it's the national level. Uh, databases are typically expanded over time from serious offenders to more minor offenders. At this point, all US states require anyone con convicted of a felony to be added to the state DNA database. And those are all um, linked up to CODIS, uh, which is run by the FBI, so you can compare people across states. The policy frontier in the US at this point is adding anyone arrested for a crime or people convicted of more minor offenses like misdemeanors. And so here is um, a map as of 2018, so it's a little out of date, but it's hard to get um, up to date uh, policy metrics on this uh, from the NCSL. Uh, this is all the states that include at least some arrestees in the DNA database. You can see it's a good number of states, but not all of them. And this is not necessarily all arrestees. It might be like only arrestees in um, very serious um, violent crimes, for instance. So let me tell you a little bit about, about, about Denmark's um, DNA database and the policy change we're gonna look at here. So the database was first established in that country in the year 2000. At that point, it only included those with, charged with very serious violent offenses and only in cases where DNA was actually necessary for the current investigation. So if you know, DNA was not relevant in the, in the investigation, then that person was not in the database. Then in 2005, there was an expansion that added anyone charged with a crime punishable by at least a year and a half in prison. Um, so this is roughly comparable to anyone charged with a felony in the United States. It also removed that requirement about relevance to the investigation. And so you also had some people that you know, were very serious offenders who were excluded before and now, now they would be added. This policy change was effective in uh, May 25th, 2005. Uh, a, un a relatively unique thing about the Denmark context is that 
uh, people in Denmark, uh, like many Europeans, take real summer vacations. And so everyone goes on vacation this summer, the criminals and the police officers alike. And so the police departments were severely understaffed during June through August. Um, as you'll see in the graphs, I'll show you the implementation is a little slow. So we have to do a bunch of the paper to deal with that. Um, but in general, there's a huge jump in the, the share of all offenders who are added to the database. Um, uh, so any, uh, everyone who was charged with a crime in Denmark, um, it went from about 4% of those people were added to the DNA database in May to about 40% by October. So a really big, big expansion. So how are we gonna use this database expansion to measure, measure the causal effect on the offender's behavior? So I want you to imagine two identical offenders. One happens to be charged on May 24th, one happens to be charged on May 25th. That database expansion goes into effect on May 25th. That means the first guy uh, does not go in the DNA database, but the second one does. But everything else about them is the same. And they're, you know, they're living through the same context. Policing is the same. Everything else is the same. But the second person, the person who's charged just one day later, is now in this DNA database and can be linked to other crimes that he commits in the future when law enforcement otherwise might not have thought of him. And so when we, uh, so we can think of this as almost this, this date of charge being essentially like randomizing people into treatment or not, right? And so that means that as I'm going to show you, when we see that the first person, the people who are not in the DNA database, are much more likely to be charged and convicted of crimes going forward, we can attribute that difference this, uh, in the subsequent behavior to the effect of that treatment of being added to the DNA registration. So uh, just a quick note on what we're measuring. Uh, so you can think of, of this natural experiment helping us control for everything else that's going on. So all of the societal changes or changes in the criminal justice system, including a general increase in the collection and use of DNA evidence, are going to affect those charged both before and after that reform. So those char charged just before the expansion are going to serve as comparison group or control group for all those other changes. Another thing you should keep in mind is that police can get a warrant to obtain DNA from anyone identified as a suspect in a crime. So being added to the DNA database increases the probability that someone is identified in a suspect in the first place in cases where they would not otherwise be on law enforcement's radar. So if you have you know, a woman who was murdered, the husband's probably the most likely suspect, you don't need a DNA database to tell you that, right? So there are lots of cases where um, for various reasons, you don't need the DNA database to lead you to, the, to, to give you more leads, um, but in a lot of cases you do. And so that's what we're measuring here. We're, we're interested in what effect does that have on reoffending, uh, and that's that's uh, those are the results I'm going to show you. So here's just the essentially the first stage effect. What's the effect of, um, of the reform on the likelihood of being added to the DNA database? And so this is showing you the share of all individuals charged with a crime who are added to Denmark's DNA database. And so you can see leading up to the reform, it's pretty flat. It's around 4%. These gray dots are the summer holidays that I mentioned when everyone's been on vacation. But you can see by about October, um, it, it starts leveling off. Um, there's still you know, quite a, a bit of churn, so it doesn't become totally flat. There are always new people entering uh, the, the criminal market, but, um, but we get this big jump from basically April um, or May to October. And then this is what happens to recidivism. So this is showing you the probability that individual offenders um, are convicted of any new crime uh, within one year. We can look in the paper up to three years out and basically the results are all very similar. Basically, these are the people that are charged, you know, uh, all the way back to 2003 through 2005. It's pretty flat what the recidivism rate is. And then these are the summer months when a lot of people aren't being added because they're understaffed. But we see this big drop, basically. Once you actually like get everybody who's supposed to be in the database in there, we see this big reduction in their likelihood of reoffending, um, And that is a 42% reduction. And of course, like if uh, because we're more likely to be detecting you in the first place, if you're in the database, we're more likely to, to find you and, and, and convict you, uh, this is going to be biased a little bit upward, actually. So we show in the paper, we can kind of separate that and do a lot of fancy stuff there. But basically, most of this effect is coming through deterrence. Um, and so it is based, it's pretty, the, the punchline is pretty close to that big 42% drop um, in the likelihood of, of a new conviction and a new crime. We can also look at the number of new convictions that individuals uh, are, are convicted of. Um, this is again within one year, and we see a, a, a somewhat similar result. We see it. This is it, here. It's the drop is even more apparent. Um, the number of new convictions falls by forty nine percent. So we can, you know, dig into the types of offenders who are most affected and the types of crimes that are prevented. Um, this so the overall effects do include big drops in violent crime. Um, so we see a 48% um, in uh, decline in, in new convictions for those who were initially added to the database because of a violent charge. And we can also see that about there's a 60% decline in new convictions 
um, uh, in, in subsequent um, uh, violent crime convictions. Um, and the other kind of things I want to point out here is the effects are bigger um, for, for first time offenders and especially for younger offenders, people age 18 to 23. So putting people into the database early in their criminal justice career can be more helpful. So what are the policy takeaways here? This research shows that adding people charged with a felony offense to a government DNA database has important public safety benefits. Increasing the probability of getting caught for future offenses has a big deterrent effect on both violent and property crime. Adding people when they're younger and earlier in their criminal careers has the biggest benefits. Uh, and in case you're thinking, what does Denmark have to do with the US? I have an earlier paper uh, using US data, uh, much messier US data, but still uh, data from the US, finding very similar or results that are very much in line um, with these overall effects. So what uh, the other kind of thing to keep in mind is you're thinking about policy, or what are the costs? So that's about the benefits, right? What are the costs here? The financial costs of expanding existing DNA databases are relatively low, but the main cost to consider that people worry about is privacy. So DNA databases do require collecting genetic material. Uh, they do only use that material to create an identifying string of numbers. So think again, it's a more accurate fingerprint, but reasonable people differ in how much they worry about this, right? Um, one thing I want to highlight, though, is that alternative strategies can be much more invasive. So if you think about things like putting cameras everywhere, or increasing police surveillance, or putting people in prison for a really long time, those all are also really invasive and, uh, and uh, inv invade your privacy. Uh, and so it's not, you know, DNA databases are nothing. So, and I think especially when used as an alternative to incarceration, there's real potential here for DNA databases to dramatically reduce the overall invasiveness of the criminal justice system and reduce uh, mass incarceration. And so I will leave it there. I do have a Bloomberg op-ed on this um, if you're interested in, a, in something in writing. And of course, everything is on my website. Uh, and uh, yeah, thank you very much.